very good morning to all of you. Welcome to the ceremonial inauguration of the third International Research Symposium on Social Science and Humanities, IRSSSH 2020, organized by the National Center for Advanced Studies in CAS. This is a virtual symposium coming to you live from the auditorium of the university's grant commission. Ladies and gentlemen, to formally commence the event, I would like to introduce the following distinguished invitees who grace us at the head table. Senior Professor Sampa Tamaratunga, the chief guest chairman of the University Grant Commission. Senior Professor Janita, Janita Lianege, symposium chair of IRSSSH 2020, acting director of NCAS, and the vice chairman of the University Grants Commission. Senior Professor H.D. Karunaratna, Symposium Co-Chair of IRSSSH 2020 and Visiting Research Fellow at NCAS. Thank you very much. Once again, a warm welcome to the ceremonial inauguration of the third International Research Symposium on Social Science and Humanities 2020. NCAS is a pioneer institute that provide, through funding and other assistance, the opportunity for academics to engage with their research and to draw new insights. One such milestone of NCAS is the International Symposium on Social Sciences and Humanities, which is held for the third consecutive year this time. The symposium provides an excellent opportunity for practitioners, academics, policymakers and researchers to share their experiences and expertise through their presentation of high quality research. The theme of this year's symposium is advances in social sciences, challenges and opportunities. First and foremost, to welcome all our distinguished guests, let me call upon co-chairperson of the symposium, Senior Professor H.D. Karunaratna. Very good morning to all of you. Today, uh, we are inaugurating a third international research symposium on social sciences and humanities, IRSSH 2020, advances in uh, social sciences and humanities, challenges and opportunities. Uh, welcome to the uh, inauguration ceremony. First, uh, Professor, Senior Professor Sampa Tamaratunga, uh, chairman of UGC as the chief guest of today's event. And we have guest of honor, uh, senior professor uh, uh, Janita Lianage, uh, vice chairman of uh, UGC and acting director of uh, NCASH. Uh, all other distinguished invitees, uh, track chairs, uh, session chairs, uh, keynote speaker, mm, paper presenters, uh, Welcome to the uh, conference today. Uh, I think this is a landmark uh, conference at uh, NCAS, uh, third uh, international conference. Uh, two of our keynote speakers uh, joining from UK today. Uh, there, there were some papers also uh, from all over the world. Uh, we got more than uh, 300 uh, research papers, uh, and we uh, finally we accepted uh, and. Uh, uh, published today as the proceedings, 100 research papers on social sciences and humanities. So I think uh, it is great success from uh, last August. Uh, we, uh, our wheel started in last August uh, through uh, out this uh, period, even this uh, COVID uh, impact was on uh, uh, our organizing uh, activities. Uh, actually, our keynote speaker today uh, is speaking on impact of COVID-19 uh, on research activities of social sciences and humanities. So which is very valid point today. The biggest challenge uh, ever we are facing today is COVID-19. I hope that how we overcome this challenge uh, through the social sciences and humanities is very vital uh, for researchers uh, in this area. So in that uh, 
uh, context. Uh, we have organized uh, three tracks and uh, uh, many sessions today and tomorrow uh, throughout the day. So for uh, particularly uh, this conference, I should thank particularly uh, Professor, uh, Sam Senior Professor Sampa Tamaratunga uh, coming as, uh, uh, joining us with, uh, 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 as a uh, uh, UGC chairman uh, because we know that uh, mainly uh, the chairman of the UGC uh, running with a very busy schedule, uh, but despite his uh, other work, uh, I should thank for him and uh, also Professor Janita Lienege as well. Uh, so I don't want to take much time uh, for I, I would like to congratulate all uh, uh, presenters and uh, I should thank for all uh, conference uh, uh, chairs, track chairs, uh, as well as uh, other uh, conference organizers uh, and the committee members. Thank you very much uh, for uh, participating for today's conference. Thank you very much, Professor. Now I would like to cordially invite Pro Senior Professor Sampa Tamaratunga, the chief guest for today's event, Chairman, University Grant Commission, to address the gathering. Good morning, Professor Janita Lienage, Vice Chairperson, University Grants Commission, and also who is handling NCS, Professor H.D. Karunaratna, co-chair of the conference, board of NCS, all deans of uh, humanities and social sciences, and also arts faculties, participants, ladies and gentlemen. Looking at this small place, very few people, chief guest, guest of honor, co-chairs, and few people here. This is not what we have experienced so far when it is come to conferences like this. We have conferences normally, especially the inauguration in hotels, five-star hotels. People come from all over the country, sometimes from all over the world. Think about the cost of traveling, cost of the time, then so many things, including but this has become, but this abnormality has become normal today. This is called new normal. So in a way, this is good actually. And a lot of participants are there, maybe 99% working from home and publication is not Quality-wise, we cannot undermine the high quality. So we are maintaining the quality as well. So maybe this technology-driven uh, higher education system is good. And this is, we have found this as a remedy for inefficiency maybe. Arts faculties, we cannot undermine in this country. Definitely there is a problem when it is come to unemployment. What we produce may not get 100% jobs in the market. That is true. But if you take the staff and the ability of staff and efficiency of staff, they are not second to other faculties. They are working very hard. Their output is, can be matched with any other academic in other faculties. And the infrastructure is not second to any other place. So there are so many 
areas where we can see a huge development. But at the same time, when it is come to unemployment, it's there. So this abnormality or the new normal situation will drive all of us to a better solution in future. All our students now come online. They never miss classes. They listen to all video lectures, video conferences, and they come on line and do their vivas and everything the technology when it is come to usage they are equal to anybody so i have statistics i have seen all faculties of social sciences their rate of participation their rate of uh, having classes even from the first uh, wave we had from uh, March to August, our records are very high. Sometimes art facult arts faculties have done, technology-wise, better than engineering. So we have records. So I think this is, in a way, uh, naturally we are driving in a path where we can equal other uh, variables as well with other faculties. So thank you so much. With this uh, environment, Professor Karu, I know how much you have devoted. Thank you very much. Having all other work at the UGC, Professor Janita is going all the time to NCS to look after that place as well. Thank you so much. And without undermining our social science research, so we have materialized today's conference and long way to go, long way to go. And uh, we are very soon, we are going to issue the uh, Professor Circular as well, maybe within another at least two months time. And we should not promote uh, papers when it is come to number of papers. So we have to uh, promote uh, quality of papers, right? But our arts faculty, uh, young academic staff are doing very well today, very well today. And uh, the only problem we have is when it is come to scopus and other databases, those who use the mother language especially Singhala and Tamil, we don't have an index there to uh, upload all our information. So we have uh, discussions with Scopus as well. And because some other countries, they have their own uh, indexing system. So we have to go for an uh, index like that in order to develop really uh, social sciences. So. Uh, thank you so much. And let me leave also. Uh, I have another conference. I want to go to USJ for another uh, conference. That's why. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. Adapting to the new normal and getting help with the technology, we are also coming live from the UGC auditorium. Now, uh, I would like to invite Senior Professor Janita Lienege, Guest of Honor, Symposium Chair, Acting Director of NKAS, and the Vice Chairman, University Grant Commission, to address the gathering. Thank you very much. Uh, Senior Professor H.T. Karuna Ratna. The uh, visiting research fellow and the co uh, 
chair of the symposium. Keynote speaker, Professor Siri Hettige and plenary speakers. The council members of NCAS, researchers, participants, and all the reviewers and the, the organizing committee members. Actually, it gives me a great pleasure to address you at this moment at the third International Symposium on Social Sciences and Humanities 2020 with the theme of Advances in Social Sciences and Humanities, Challenges and Opportunities. And with this will be held today and tomorrow uh, at the auditorium we are going to start, but this will continue uh, these two days. Actually, when we started uh, organizing this, it was a great challenge. And we had to, we had to wait until the situation, we had to look at, look, the, look at the situation, what will happen, and we had to book se several places, but finally we had to uh, do it in this way anyway. Though it is a challenge, we could not, we do not, we, we did not stop this one. We wanted to somehow do it in the new normal situation. So uh, we had to restrict the participants, but you all are connected online. So uh, anyway, while thanking and welcoming you all, we have to adapt to the situation. So uh, anyway, I congratulate the organizing committee for organizing this. I know they had many sleepless nights and uh, some were work actually in the office throughout the day and night. And anyway, I'm very happy that it has become, uh, it will, it, it came to this success. So uh, I think as uh, the UGC chairman mentioned, you all know uh, NCASH is providing grants for the social science and humanities and arts, uh, young staff to uh, secure or get their higher studies. Uh, anyway, we want to increase and we want to streamline it some more. But the thing is, uh, we want them to uh, upgrade their knowledge and come back to the country and serve the country because we want to have uh, the same standards and everything similar in all areas of the education systems. So we provide grants, and I think most of the uh, papers, uh, researchers are beneficiaries of this grant scheme. So we got, as Professor Karuna Ratna said, we got about 300 papers. And today we are going to have, today and tomorrow, we are going to present uh, more than 100 pr uh, presentations. And also we are going to publish the best papers of this full papers in the Journal of NCASH. So it will be published very soon. And Professor Karuna Ratna, I <laughs> request you to uh, take that task also. Right, uh, and I also believe that uh, we have to, we should not, uh, you know, uh, be you know be in one area you have to we have to have multidisciplinary approach in in uh, in the research that is how we can proceed and how we can use your knowledge and the others knowledge to the development of this country so I invite all the researchers to get into that platform and combining this your research, I know as a scientist how the social sciences and 
humanities research is important in in science and environment research research so i in request you all to get together and make collaborations with the other areas and uh, you know make your knowledge use your knowledge and research findings to the development of this country so at this onset i actually once again congratulate all the uh, organizing committee members reviewers researchers and everybody and i wish you all and uh, hope this will be a very fruitful symposium these two days so wish you all a good day thank you very much professor now the most awaited uh, moment the keynote speech to introduce the keynote speaker who will be joining with us online i would like to invite senior professor h d karuna ratna i think uh, in the speech of uh, our chief guest uh, senior professor sampa tamarutunga uh, mentioned that uh, uh, not only quantity quality is also matter uh, for research uh, by going that uh, uh, footsteps we conduct this uh, online uh, uh, conference today uh, because we selected uh, an eminent scholar uh, and researcher uh, in the line of social sciences in sri lanka so today our keynote speaker is emeritus professor uh, siri hetige uh, one of the best uh, social science researchers in uh, sri lanka uh, siri hetige is presently emeritus professor of sociology uh, at the university of colombo earlier uh, he held the positions of senior professor and chair of sociology uh, senior student counselor uh, dean uh, faculty of arts uh, director social policy uh, analysis and research center uh, at the university of colombo uh, beside his uh, substantive positions held in university of colombo he held visiting appointments uh, several other uh, sri lankan universities he also has wide international experience commencing from uh, his postgraduate uh, studies at monash university australia followed by research and teaching assignments at number of universities between 1988 and 2019 in such countries as switzerland uk usa german finland uh, australia his most recent uh, overseas academic appointment was at uh, rmit university australia uh, he held the position of uh, adjunct professor Uh, from uh, 2015 to 2018 at university of heldberg uh, uh, german uh, of course uh, uh, i i think he has credentials uh, as i think all sri lankan social scientists uh, know about uh, professor uh, siri hetige uh, he is emeritus professor from the university of uh, uh, colombo and uh, by going uh, with our theme today uh the challenges and opportunities uh he agreed to speak on uh, impact of uh, covid-19 on uh, the social sciences and humanities researchers and it will be great help for all uh, researchers uh, in this discipline uh, so without taking much time i would like to invite uh, professor siri hetige uh, for today's keynote speech Uh, 
lecture that I'm making this morning. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, you know, what we are doing is uh, always ongoing. Uh, it's like a pandemic. Uh, and therefore, especially uh, once the, uh, the last session, we can reflect on the things that I'm uh, starting more, uh, you know, uh, closely uh, later on. But for the moment, I will uh, remain, uh, you know, very much focused on uh, this, uh, this very basic outline that I have calculated. Uh, I also want to make a, an introductory remark. Uh, it is very important, it is really uh, heartening for me uh, to make this brief uh, presentation um, today uh, at uh, the conference organized by the uh, inventor. Uh, I want, really want to uh, mention that uh, I was very, very enthusiastic uh, when this uh, center was considered. In fact, I had a personal handy list. I worked very closely with the President of Malamak and I'm really pleased that it is uh, doing very well and that it has become what uh, I in fact wanted, uh, I, I in fact felt uh, that it should be and that is uh, a national focal point for the social sciences and the humanities. Uh, what I feel is uh, that, uh, that we have so many universities now, you know, like when uh, uh, we started as undergraduates, uh, and therefore uh, we have universities uh, in different parts of the country, and it is uh, absolutely necessary uh, that we have a focal point, and that is why this sector has become so critical. And I'm also very pleased to see so many academic uh, young academics from different universities uh, presenting papers at this conference. Uh, now, let me turn to my, uh, my uh, presentation. Uh, as you can see, uh, the theme uh, is uh, very much on COVID-19 pandemic. Now, here, uh, we all know that it is a, it's an unprecedented uh, health crisis. But this health crisis has very wide-ranging ramifications uh, in terms of uh, the economy, in terms of society, uh, in terms of uh, individual lives, you know, their psychological well-being, and also, of course, culture. Uh, not to mention, uh, you know, various other environmental uh, factor considerations that we have to focus attention on. Uh, now. Uh, the point that I want to make here is that we are at a critical juncture, uh, not just uh, in, in Sri Lanka, but uh, the whole world. We are at a critical juncture. In other words, we are, you know, basically in between two different worlds. Uh, we are, the world that we are living in today is the world dominated by the pandemic. But we have to remember that this is not the world that existed prior to uh, January uh, 2020. It was the pre-COVID world, and that was functioning uh, quite uh, ex efficiently, smoothly, and people were very enthusiastic about that world, and everybody was trying their best to make use of the opportunity. <laughs> And then also, uh, Professor Karnar knows very well that we have a huge migrant population, worker population, 1.6 million or maybe even a bit more, uh, you know, working in different parts of the world. So that, that, that the world has been, you know, very much uh, an open field for many people, including the ordinary people, not just uh, the business people and academics, but for ordinary people to move around and make uh, whatever they could um, to deal with the day-to-day -day lives uh, that they have to lead. Um, so 
so that that world uh, you know is behind you know, you know right now it's behind us because uh, it is not functioning in the way that it was uh, structured uh, until uh, until uh, you know the pandemic uh, commenced uh, in uh, early uh, 2020 uh, I, I don't have to tell you very much about it you are all familiar with uh, the situation uh, that uh, emerged after the pandemic, uh, as you can see, uh, you know, most of the things that people were doing cannot be done anymore at any level, whether it's on a global level uh, or regional level, national level, even at a community level. So we have a we have a very we have a very different situation. But the point is that we cannot really, uh, you know, forget about the pre-COVID world because uh, many people think that uh, we can really restore uh, that pre-COVID world uh, immediately after the pandemic uh, it, it comes under control. But uh, I think as social scientists, uh, our role is to uh, explore the world around us in time and space. I want to emphasize the two terms, time and space. We are not looking at things you know, here and now. We have been looking at things uh, over time, that's why we have a, we have we have a history uh, as a major subject uh, in our universities because you cannot really understand the present world without looking at the past and and I don't have to explain this uh, in any detail to an audience of this nature because you all know uh, our past and how that past has shaped our present. And therefore, uh, we uh, we have to take uh, some of the things that uh, we inherited from the past for granted because we cannot change some of the historical uh, things. So the point that I'm trying to make is that we have to engage in a critical appraisal of uh, the pre-COVID world because we might not be able to really take the pre-COVID world with us, you know, you know, without really making major, major changes. And that is not only in view of the COVID pandemic, which is because we all know uh, that we are surrounded by so many other challenges. Uh, even today, you know, I mean, certainly uh, it, it, we have been discussing these things for a long time, but the point is that the pandemic is one of the biggest issues, but at the same time we should not ignore uh, other major challenges that we have to face, you know, like climate change is, 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 rea is reality, and we see it happening, and Sri Lanka is very much exposed to uh, climate risk. We are number six, you know, in the in the, in the, in the in the list, uh, yeah, and, and, and we are very much a vulnerable country uh, to climate change. And then, of course, we have massive environmental problems around the world. I don't have to again explain, all of you know, but the point is that we have to address these environmental challenges 
you know, and then really bring them under control because it really prevents us from, you know, having a kind of uh, secure lives, uh, livelihoods and, and, you know, whatever other freedoms that we enjoy as well. And then finally, the whole, you know, the issue of uh, inequality, global inequality and the disparities and so on and so forth. So the point is that the pre-COVID world is not something that we can, you know, take forward without, you know, revisiting it, without, you know, transforming. And that is really at the agreement across the world today, as you know, the, the UN, uh, you know, Sustainable Development Framework, uh, you know, very much focused on this and, and they call it uh, transforming our world. In other words, they were talking about transforming the pre-COVID world, not the world that we are talking about today. But then on the other hand, now, of course, we are not, uh, you know, in the pre-COVID world because we are now in the, in the post-COVID world not post-COVID, actually the world are dominated by the, by the pandemic. And therefore, uh, it is absolutely necessary that we, uh, you know, uh, study and explore uh, what is really happening around the world, you know, during this pandemic. And that is uh, one of our major, uh, you know, areas uh, of, of, uh, of, of uh, work, actually. And of course, uh, I will come to that a little later, but uh, for the moment, uh, let me say that the second world that we are talking about is the world that we are living in right now. And then finally, uh, you know, we are talking about uh, another world, and that is the world that is going to emerge after the pandemic. Is that going to be uh, the same as what was before? Or, you know, certainly, you know, the present world, we cannot, we cannot live in the present world as it is, because um, we cannot live with, uh, with the pandemic. We have to get it behind us, and that is why uh, we are so reliant on we are so reliant on uh, the medical uh, experts. Uh, you know, there are all kinds of uh, possibilities. Certainly, we are talking about uh, the, you know uh, we are talking about uh, vaccines and and so and so forth. But the point is that you know it is not only a, a medical problem, and as you all know, uh, our people are you know, grappling with so many other issues like economic problems, uh, social issues, uh, you know, psychological problems. And then, of course, you know, the cultural, you know, issues that we are grappling with. And as you know, uh, Sri Lanka is a theatre, uh, you know, where, we, you know, these cultural wars are being waged uh, around the issue of the pandemic. It's unfortunate, but that is a fact. And that is, of course, something that we uh, can easily uh, understand as social scientists and, of course, humanities uh, scholars. Now, I uh, I want to you know uh, you know also talk about a little bit about the, the the world that is going to sort of emerge, and of course uh, you know it, you know it it, 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 it it will not be a carbon copy of uh, what uh, we had seen before the pandemic because. You know, the pre-COVID world became so vulnerable to this pandemic. And of course, we cannot rule out another, you know, virus emerging and spreading across the world because, uh, you know, that is the, you know, the trend that has been. Uh, and of course, we cannot say that that trend will not continue. In other words, you know, this, when this virus came, you know, nobody knew about that particular strain. And therefore, they had to study, it, and then they had to, you know, you know, adjust the behavior of people to really, you know, deal with that uh, major challenge. And then, of course, uh, you know, it's not a matter of uh, living with it; it's a matter of getting it out of our way so that we could really get back to uh, the life that human beings deserve to live, and and that is a normal life. You know, uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a social, cultural, uh, and, and various other settings. And therefore, we are very much looking forward to having uh, some kind of normalcy restored so that the people can get on with their lives. And otherwise, you know, it, it, will, be, it will be a major, major, major problem. Now, the question is, you know, how to, how to understand the vulnerability? Now, we know that the pre-COVID world was vulnerable, vulnerable. 
to this pandemic, and that is why the whole world, uh, you know, is in disarray at the moment uh, because we, you know, our, the way we were organized before the pandemic uh, was not uh, really conducive for resilience, conducive for uh, life, uh, you know, on Earth uh, in the way that we, uh, we, we, we we got accustomed to living. So therefore, it is very important that we. Uh, really revisit uh, the pre-COVID world and ask, you know, what what kind of changes that we really need to. And I think we have enough ideas around the world, and I, I already alluded to it. Actually, we cannot live in the way that we have been living, and I think this is where the social scientists and human uh, human uh, you know, science scholars uh, have a very major role role to play. Uh, I think when it comes to uh, the role of the social scientists and humanities scholars, uh, they are very, very important because uh, they provide uh, the, the evidence that is necessary for us to deal with problems that we are uh, confronted with uh, at any time in any place. Um, so the research that you know different social scientists do uh, has been very much, uh, you know, important, uh, has been very much instrumental in bringing about, bringing about change. Now, the point that I'm trying to make here is that the pre-COVID pre world was not a uniform world. It was an unequal world. And societies were very different. Societies were organized very differently. Of course, human societies have been changing over time. But then when you look at the situation that prevailed before the pandemic uh, erupted, it was, it was not a uniform world, it was, it was a globalized world, but on the other hand, it was also a world characterized by, uh, you know, so much inequality uh, and so much, uh, so many disparities uh, and, and so on and so forth. And, and you can see societies um, have responded to this pandemic in very different ways. And I don't have to tell you, you only have to go to the website, you know, to go to uh, world or meter uh, website and that will give you the situation in each and every country uh, and a snapshot and that you will see the differences across the world. So in other words, the, the, pandemic, the, the pandemic was common to everyone. I mean, we all, we all we are all affected by the pandemic and the virus is around us. The virus is around us, wherever we are. But the point is that, uh, that, the, that, the, the, that society uh, managed very differently, and how did how did different societies manage differently? And that is the clue that we have to take uh, from the pre-COVID world as social scientists and humanities scholars. We are talking about you know uh, economic structures. We talk about you know social systems. Uh, we talk about you know cultural patterns like you know education system, media, and so and so forth. So we have a uh, we have a we have an understanding of the uh, pre-COVID world at a societal level in terms of how they were organized. And because they were so differently organized, they managed very differently. And I don't have to tell you anything more about it. You, want, you can look at the difference between East Asia and South Asia. Now, how did South Asians respond very differently compared to, let's say, uh, how did the uh, East Asians uh, respond very differently compared to South Asians? Uh, and so on. And then, of course, you can see also how, uh, you know, how Europe has been affected, you know, and how uh, the America, you know, the United States has been, you know, very much devastated uh, by, the, by the pandemic. And so now, now that is the social science uh, knowledge uh, that helps you to understand the, the way the societies dealt with uh, the pandemic. And I think that is something that we have to learn from the pre-COVID world, and, and that would help us to understand how we have to get ourselves organized post-COVID. Uh, I don't think that I can, I, I don't want to go uh, I, I, more and more on this. Uh, I, I, I think uh, I have, I'm halfway through in my uh, kind of uh, presentation. Uh, let me, uh, let me see how I could uh, really uh, look at, you know, uh, the, uh, the situation. Uh, you know, and how uh, the social scientists and, and humanities scholars can deal with it. And of course, you know, social scientists, sciences are very different, and, uh, you know, and we deal with different aspects of uh, society, 
you know, economists, uh, they naturally look at the economy and they look at how the economy is function and how, you know, how economies can be developed, how economics can be managed and so on and so forth. And then, of course, you have political scientists, you know, looking at their political systems and how political systems, you know, are, you know, behaving uh, in different countries to, you know, meet the challenges that the people face and, and so on and so forth. And then, of course, you know, we have uh, other, like sociologists, we look at, you know, the social system and we look at how social system uh, can be, you know, really, you know, adapted. Uh, to suit the uh, changing uh, circumstances and so on and so forth. So, for instance, uh, you know, like in modern urban industrial societies, um, you know, state, uh, you know, has a very major role to play compared to, let's say, pre-industrial societies. Pre-industrial societies were highly decentralized, like feudal societies, and the people were basically living, you know, in scattered, scattered communities, but whereas, uh, you know, post-industrial societies are very different and we are today talking about mega cities. And even in Sri Lanka, we were talking about a mega police, for instance, mega police, you see. But, so the point is that mega cities is something very new and it is, uh, uh, it is very, very, very new because uh, there were no mega cities uh, before economic liberalization in the, in, the, in the late 70s, for instance. And, uh, and of course, you also know how our uh, situation changed, uh, you know, after 1977. Uh, for instance, uh, you know, there was really hard, I mean, when we were in the, in the university um, in Colombo, uh, you, know, you know, in the early 70s, uh, I remember Colombo was a very different place. And it was a, it was a very leisurely place. And, uh, you know, and, and, you know, we were walking around a lot and so on. So, also, Colombo was a very different place. And it was, in fact, it was uh, something like what, uh, uh, you know, Patrick Geddes in, in the 1920s, uh, you know, perceived, uh, uh, you know, Colombo, uh, uh, you know, as a garden city. Colombo was perceived as a garden city. And, uh, you know, if you go to the centenary, uh, volume of, of published by the uh, Kalambo Municipal Council, you will see the, the history. And of course, you know, we didn't have, uh, uh, you know, we didn't have a urban development authority. We had a town and country planning department, you know, in, 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 in Sri Lanka. Town and country planning, in other words, you know, our focus was not the city. Our focus was very much the countryside. That is because we had the rural urban balance. And we had a very small population in Colombo, about you know uh, three lakhs, uh, just over three lakhs, uh, and, and and of course the, around Colombo, uh, it was uh, it was so much greener, and uh, we used to walk around, travel around in Colombo, uh, go in any direction, and it was basically farmland, just uh, across uh, the inner circle of Colombo and the and the immediate suburbs, you you were basically moving into villages. And there were, you know, thriving, uh, you know, farmland, and you could see cattle roaming around, even, you know, even, even on street, and so on. So the point is that the whole situation changed. Now you can see we have we have a we have a very different urban uh, picture in 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 in, uh, in Colombo, uh, and and also in the Colombo uh, district. And then of course, even if you go to other other cities. Uh, they, are, they are very big and, you know, and so on and so forth. So the point is that that's why we, we, we moved away from town and country planning to urban development. But the point is um, that, uh, that we have to do it very carefully because, you know, urban centers were the most vulnerable to COVID. Urban centers were the most vulnerable to COVID. And you can see across the world, you know, you can see what happened to New York. Uh, you know, what happened to, you know, other big cities in the U.S. and also in Europe uh, and so on. So, so the point is that that whole landscape, uh, you know, has to be looked at, you know, from the point of view of the impact of the pandemic. In other words, <clears throat> you know, the social scientists have a very major role to play and the geographers, uh, you know, have a very major role to play because land use planning is so important. Uh, and you know, uh, and, and we, we we certainly cannot 
just you know be uh, uh, you know uh, irrational uh, careless about managing our uh, resources land water and and so on and so forth at the end of the day we are talking about quality of life quality of life depends uh, you know you know so many things uh, and i think we we certainly have to uh, you know look at you know uh, the, the conditions that have emerged after the pandemic and see how we could really readjust uh, and and so and so forth so the point that i'm trying to make here is that we uh, certainly have to make use of our uh, our ideas our you know research techniques and our capabilities uh, which we have uh, in, in plenty you know in, in this country in the universities and so, and so forth how to mobilize that 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 expertise how to mobilize the, the capacity uh, to really you know study uh, what is really uh, what has what has been going on what is going on and what we would want to see in the in the future so in other words we are talking about uh, charting uh, you know future for us i mean this is really the discussion that should happen everywhere uh, you know certainly globally uh, i think in global institutions like the, the un uh, and and other you know uh, you know state and non state organizations are very much Uh, doing that, and I think we have to also do the same in, in, in Sri Lanka, and we have to figure out, you know, how we could uh, really facilitate the transition from COVID to post-COVID. And it is not something that would happen naturally. Uh, it would not happen, uh, you know, because we have brought the uh, the, uh, uh, the pandemic under control. Uh, i think it, it it has to be facilitated i think the intervention is role of the social scientists i think is very important you know our you know we are we are of course you know very much interested in knowledge uh, and that is what we our main job is to produce knowledge and how do you produce knowledge we do research and we collect data and we analyze data and based on our data uh, we we come to certain uh, conclusions and then we say Uh, we could do this we could do that and so on and so forth and this is what uh, this is what the social scientists have to do and i think we have to manage the economy we have to manage our social uh, social system uh, we have to manage our cultural uh, you know relations because you cannot you know we cannot continue uh, when there is uh, tension in society because tension is not good uh, whether it is uh, tension in, in, in your mind whether it is tension out there in the community it is the same i think it is it is as bad to be in tension as an individual as uh, you know to have uh, society in tension because uh, it it really unsettles people you know it doesn't really give you the the space to you know reflect you know, the space to think space to really plan and so on so on and therefore we have to create the conditions under which individuals will function fully and then also societies will also function fully and i think that is why we we have to manage you know our uh, you know cultural relations because um, you know as you all know uh, we are always living in two different worlds so we are always living in two different worlds we are living in a in a in a in a real world world that is out there without our intervention it is there and then there is a world that we have built in our own mind in other words you know uh, the imagined world i think people are living uh, you know most people are living in a, in, a, in in an imagined world you know they 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 perceive a world around them and that is not necessarily the real world and i think we have to really bridge this gap as much as we can you cannot really bridge the gap between the real world and the imagined world Uh, fully it is not possible uh, but on the other hand if you have if you have uh, if you have some reconciliation between the between the uh, the real world and and the perceived world then you have some degree of uh, uh, peace between the two worlds otherwise the two worlds will collide and i think it is absolutely necessary that we also manage uh, you know uh, the world views uh, of, of of people uh, and i think that is the role of the 
in the education system, the media, and so on and so forth. Um, and I think the social scientists who train a lot of the teachers in the country uh, have a major role to play in, you know, conveying some of these uh, fundamental ideas into social sciences and humanities. Uh, but moving away from the social sciences, I, I don't want to neglect the humanities because the humanities deals with the lived experience of the people. I mean, we enjoy uh, we enjoy uh, the the things that the humanities uh, people produce. Uh, we like their drama, we like their novels, we like their poems. Uh, you know, we like you know the, the various uh, the symbolic things that they produce. Uh, and actually, we you know we enjoy reading a uh, lot of the fiction. You know, as children, uh, because uh, you know. They, they really uh, gave us, uh, you know, some understanding of what's really going on. Uh, but on the other hand, we cannot live in a fictitious world. We have to move into uh, the real world. And that is when the, 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 the other science, sciences come in. That's why we have a very vibrant uh, school curriculum. You know, we, we not only teach uh, literature, we not only teach, uh, uh, you know, drama, we not only teach, you know, visual arts and so on. We also teach, you know, the, the, the social sciences, you know, like curriculum. Unfortunately, we were not able to introduce sociology. Uh, we go, so we attempted, uh, you know, a great deal about 20 years ago to introduce, uh, you know, sociology into the school curriculum. And I don't want to go into that. And that's another story. Uh, but the point is that that the, that the social scientists uh, have to recognize the contribution that the humanity scholars make because they, live, they deal with the lived experience of the people. They deal with the lived experience of the people. They capture the lived experience of the people. And I think that is really uh, something that uh, can be very much complementary, not only at an individual level, but at a, at a societal level. So the point is that we, we certainly have to have this uh, connection between the humanities and the social sciences, and that is what the center has done. Now, uh, moving moving on, uh, moving on, uh, I want to now turn to the nitty gritty aspects of what we do as social scientists. Certainly, um, social scientists uh, have uh, are doing research, and why do they do research? Actually, we have to do research not just uh, not just uh, you know to get our marks, and the points, and and get our promotions. Uh, I think we also need to do research to enrich, uh, you know, uh, uh, people and to produce uh, useful knowledge uh, and so on. So uh, I think we need to really figure out how we could do, uh, you know, this kind of research, uh, you know, under conditions of the, the pandemic. Uh, now, of course, uh, you know, social scientists, uh, you know, rely on primary data and the secondary data, primary data is the data that you go out and collect, and the secondary data is that you tap uh, from uh, from uh, the institutions, the various census and statistics or central bank or IPS or whatever. Uh, but, but the point is that uh, that the primary data collection, you know, uh, is something that you go out and do. I mean, you don't really do it from your office. You just you go out and you send your students out. You send your research assistants out. And you collect, you know, primary data from households, from individuals, and so on and so forth. But this is uh, challenging now because of the pandemic. But nevertheless, uh, we have to figure out how to do things, you know, under under the conditions of the pandemic. I think this is possible. This is possible, and I'm I'm right now engaged in uh, I'm right now engaged in uh, some some research, uh, and actually we are we are we are we are, we are figuring out how to adapt our methodology to do research under the conditions of the pandemic. And then it's possible. Um, so for instance, uh, you know, Sri Lanka is uh, very much, uh, you know, uh, covered by, uh, you know, the telephone. I mean, not like, say, 30, 40, 50 years ago, uh, when you had only few households having telephone. But now you have the mobile telephone, thanks to researchers, you know, uh, doing research in countries like Korea. Uh, and we have all, you know, Samsung uh, mobile telephones in our hand, including the ordinary, uh, ordinary people who are moving around to make a living on a day-to-day -day basis. So, so the point is that the people are connected. 
uh, minimum is the, the mobile telephone, and the mobile telephone is a major source of uh, information uh, that you can collect. Uh, and I think we can certainly plan, uh, you know, uh, telephone interviews. Uh, and of course, sample, sampling can be organized without any problem. And you, you can, you know, you know, really select the kind of sample you want. And then you can, you know, have your questionnaires ready. And then you can interview them and so on. And I think this is not only for social scientists. Actually, if you, if you really want to know what is happening in the country today, we have the capacity to do that. You know, we have we have we have a very intense uh, admin, uh, you know, administrative system in the country. Very very well organized administrative system in the country, going right down to the village level. At the village level, we have several government servants including the Grama Sevak, and then you have the DS office, and then you have the district office, and so on and so forth. Now, imagine, imagine if you get if you get the DS office activated to collect data. You know, you only have to establish, uh, establish um, let's say, a call center. And, you know, inform all the households in the, in the country that if you are in this situation, uh, please give a call. And then you have at the other end, you know, a number of people sitting uh, behind telephones and they can actually take down the details and so on and so forth and if you want to cross check you can easily do that because you have the village level officers and so on so that you can get fairly reliable data uh, base uh, using uh, using even the existing uh, administrative structures in the country in fact I, I propose this you know at the beginning of the pandemic but anyway that didn't happen but that's a different story again but uh, the point that I'm trying to make here is that the researchers, we can do it. Uh, we can do that. And then, of course, we have online surveys. And, you know, it's very, very easy to do online surveys. In fact, I did one, uh, you know, at the, at, you know around, around July uh, last year. And I basically covered the entire Asia region, uh, you know, by, uh, you know, identifying key informants uh, from each one of the Asian countries and I administered a questionnaire on resilience to COVID. Resilience to COVID at a, at a, at a national level. You know, they take Korea, take uh, Thailand, take, uh, you know, Vietnam and so on. So, I mean, we know some of the countries have been resilient. Now, of course, uh, we, we want to know, uh, we, we want to know from within that country, you know, I mean, like, we want to get it from the horse's mouth. We can ask, uh, you know, people who are knowledgeable, who have been engaged in, you know, various uh, COVID-related activities to tell us, you know, how uh, your country became so resilient, how, uh, you know, your country became, you know, so vulnerable, and so on. So the key informant interviews can be done, and I have done it, I haven't published it yet, but uh, one day I'll do it. But the point that I'm trying to make is that we have a repertoire of, uh, uh, you know, uh, instruments uh, that we can use as social scientists to collect data even under conditions of uh, the pandemic. Now, if we if we if we collect uh, you know uh, this kind of data, uh, we can do a uh, lot of things with the data. We can you know we can certainly uh, analyze the data and write a paper and publish it, and that's very very legitimate for academics. Uh, though I would certainly go beyond that uh, in my my work. I, in fact, most of my publications are after I became professor of sociology in Colombo. Uh, you can go to my CV and check that. But the point is that uh, that we need to really, you know, uh, balance between our personal interest and public interest. And I think it is important that we always keep public interest also in mind when we do research and, and you know, publish and so on and so forth. Now, of course, uh, uh, we want to use our data also for public purposes. We can certainly, you know, engage institutions. We can certainly engage the relevant state and non-state institutions with the data, so that you know that data will be used uh, for decision-making purposes. And then, of course, we also want to, uh, you know, promote public uh, awareness. And you can engage, you know, let's say the media, and and you know, basically uh, get the, you know, the, the the information out to the wider public, so that you also have. Uh, uh, you also have a population which is uh, very much informed by, uh, you know, evidence coming from research done by uh, our university uh, academics and so on and so forth.
And then, of course, uh, you also want to uh, promote uh, interdisciplinary uh, work because the uh, pandemic is something that has touched on almost every aspect of life. It's uh, so, I mean, I already mentioned at the beginning, uh, certainly, uh, certainly, it is a, it's a, it's an, it's a, it's a, an unprecedented health challenge and therefore we rely so much on our health sciences to uh, help us uh, to navigate this, uh, this uh, situation. Uh, but on the other hand, we also know that uh, the other institutions, uh, or the non-health institutions, um, are as important. Um, you know, and I think we certainly have to manage different sectors uh, simultaneously. We want the, the economy to be managed because that is very, very critical uh, for, for every one of us. We need to also manage the, the social uh, situation in the country, social security situation, food security, uh, you know, hunger, uh, you know, and, and you know, various other things. And then, of course, you know, we have huge psychological problems uh, faced by people, and, and we know that psychological problems uh, have become acute. And uh, do we have uh, any, any data, any research uh, done on the psychological well-being of people? Uh, and so on and so forth. You can look at different uh, segments of society being adversely affected, like, for instance, the entire school population. Uh, is, is, is really the most important uh, from our, uh, you know, national point of view because that's the future of the country and how do we take, how do we really take care of, uh, you know, their needs and so on and so forth and therefore we'll have to, you know, really get all the relevant institutions to function and uh, and I think institutions have to figure out how to, how to deal with it. Now, for instance, you know, medical scientists know about telemedicine, uh, you know, and, you know, how to, really uh, provide consultation to, uh, you know, patients, you know, remotely and, and so on and so forth. And of course, uh, you know, counseling is something that you can easily do. Uh, uh, you know, I mean, of course, it's good to have face-to-face -face, uh, conversations, but on the other hand, it is also uh, possible to uh, defuse a serious situation in a, in a, in a, in a household or, or at an individual level. If you have some someone to really talk to and, and guide and whatever, whatever so on. So the, what I'm getting at is that you know our data, uh, you know, can be collected to a considerable extent, not fully, uh, but then we have to explore uh, the possibilities and then you know develop our techniques and use the necessary instruments and so on and so forth. And therefore, we don't have to stop. But on the other hand, uh, you know, we also have to make sure that we use this data to benefit the wider society because here we are in a situation where everybody is affected. So therefore, what we do should, in, what we should do should benefit uh, everyone. And that is, the, that is the, you know, the need of the hour. And I, 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 I hope uh, we would be able to really uh, get ourselves activated as, uh, as a social scientist in, in different uh, you know, parts of the country and uh, figure out how we could continue to play our role uh, in the way that we have been we have been doing keeping in mind that we are moving into a different world after the pandemic it will never it will never be the same uh, whether it is at a lo local level whether it is at a at the country level whether it is at the global level and therefore, social sciences, I think, have a very critical role to play to understand the world around us, as I already mentioned, in time and space, and then certainly, you know, the world around us today. And I think we certainly would be able to uh, enlighten uh, the wider, wider community, uh, the governments, uh, the institutions, you know, other stakeholders, the private sector, civil society, and then, of course, uh, you know, our own, uh, you know, colleagues in the other disciplines in, in, in our university. So interdisciplinarity, I think, has to come to the fore now, uh, you know, though it has been evolving over a period of time, but I think this is the time to really close our ranks and see how we could really come together 
because we are dealing with uh, problems which are now very much interconnected and I think they cannot be really separated. So it is uh, absolutely necessary that we uh, get ourselves uh, focused and uh, understand the challenges and then understand our responsibility. Uh, I think with that, uh, I think we would be better positioned to respond to this uh, you know, situation uh, as, a, as a community of privileged people. As a community of privileged people, I think, you know, I'm now <laughs> sitting in my, in my room, uh, in my house, and I'm so privileged because I have, an, I have this uh, machine in front of me, and I have the connection, and I can talk to you uh, remotely. So in other words, we are privileged. I think it is also true in other respects because we don't starve. I mean, we don't starve. We don't uh, really run out of, uh, you know, other things. We, 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 we live a fairly uh, normal life in terms of our basic needs. But of course, we are not, uh, you know, satisfying some of the fundamental needs uh, that we, uh, we, we have besides the basic, uh, basic needs. I think we as social scientists have to not only worry about our basic needs uh, of food, shelter, and, and whatever, whatever else, but also, um, you know, certain things that satisfy us you know, human beings, and of course, as enlightened citizens of this country, and in, in this case, of course, also being privileged uh, compared to many others around you, uh, as you can see. Um, so I think we, we, we certainly have to uh, take this uh, uh, situation uh, uh, to our, our heart and see how best we could deliver uh, something that we have always been doing as, as social scientists, uh, you know, and I, I, I know that uh, there are many, many academics uh, in this country, whether it is uh, in the humanities area or in the social science area, who really feel for what they are doing. And I think it is uh, the kind of culture, academic culture, research culture, that we have to promote, promote among young, uh, young researchers. And I, I certainly want to um, uh, thank the, uh, uh, you know, the... Uh, the center, the UGC, uh, for giving me this uh, opportunity. Uh, I think you are doing uh, your, 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 your main job here uh, by bringing these uh, social science uh, researchers together and, and, and creating a focal point in the country so that we would be able to really uh, you know, play our role uh, as responsible uh, academics. And I think we would certainly be able to make a contribution to overcoming this challenge. And then, of course, uh, also think beyond the pandemic and uh, contribute to, um, you know, coming out with a vision uh, for uh, Sri Lanka uh, beyond the pandemic. And I think that is where we all have to make a collective effort. And I'm quite sure uh, all the people who are who are listening to me, uh, you know, would share this uh, sentiment, and, and and I certainly want to congratulate uh, our, our colleagues, you know, uh, uh, chairman of the UGC, the deputy uh, chairman, and uh, Kamaratna, uh, and everybody else for doing a fantastic job, and I I, I certainly want to convey my best wishes to this very important conference and I want to uh, bring my, uh, you know, fairly uh, haphazard presentation, uh, um, you know, bring, bring my very haphazard presentation to a post now. Thank you very much and I, I'm really not sure whether I'm okay doing with the time but anyway, it doesn't matter. Thank you very much. We are now living in two different worlds, pre-COVID world and the world that we are li living right now with the pandemic. It is a challenge. We should engage in critical appraisal of these worlds to overcome the challenges. 
Thank you very much, Professor, for your insightful words. Before we conclude our inauguration ceremony, I would like to again invite Senior Professor H.D. Karunaratna to brief about the sessions and tracks of the symposium. I IRSSH 2020 uh, is very important research conference on social sciences uh, in Sri Lanka. Uh, we have received about over 300 abstracts, but by now uh, we got quality full papers uh, accepted by our reviewers more than 100. Exactly 102 uh, research papers we have received. All these 102 research papers, uh, full papers with us, and will be uploaded to our uh, InCash website in future. Uh, in this regard, you know, the time and the uh, space considering, we divided all these 103, uh, 102 papers uh, into three major tracks. Uh, and each track has uh, five sessions, A, B, C, D, E sessions. Uh, track one, uh, session one, uh, due uh, for uh, accounting and management, there will be six papers under accounting and management track. Uh, then track one B uh, is named as management and HR. There will be uh, seven papers under that, tra that uh, session. Uh, track one C uh, is nom named as economics and marketing. Uh, there will be again another six papers for that. Then uh, track D, track one D, track one D, uh, is named as banking and finance. Uh, there are uh, eight papers presented uh, in this uh, tra session. Track one, the final session, is named as uh, track one E, uh, micro, small, and medium-sized enterprises and entrepreneurship. So in that session, there will be, again, uh, another uh, six papers will be presented. Uh, track one is uh, mainly representing accounting, management, economics, finance, banking, uh, uh, those are the areas, small uh, and medium enterprises and entrepreneurship. Track two, uh, again, uh, divided into uh, A, session A, session B, session C, session D, and session E. Uh, five uh, sessions uh, starting uh, from the afternoon today. Uh, that uh, track 2A uh, is uh, uh, devoted to discuss uh, education-related uh, articles. Uh, there will be about uh, nine articles presented in uh, track 1, uh, uh, track 2A. Uh, track 2B also uh, uh, devoted to uh, discuss education-related matters. We know that during this new normal situation, education play a crucial role uh, in uh, today's world. So the world can change with education. So we gave more priorities for uh, more accepted papers on education. Uh, then again, there will be another seven papers presented under the track 2B as education-related uh, 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 papers. Then track 2C uh, is devoted to discuss uh, re religion and cultural uh, events and issues and research outcomes uh, uh, on uh, religion and uh, culture. Uh, there will be uh, six papers presented in Track 2C. Track 2D is on language and literature, uh, which is also important area in social sciences and humanities. Uh, particularly, uh, there will be six uh, papers uh, presenting uh, they are uh, tomorrow uh, on uh, track to uh, C. Then we are having uh, track to E, the final track, the uh, final sessions of track two uh, on culture and visual arts. Culture and visual arts. There will be again uh, six papers presented under the uh, track to E, culture and visual arts heading. Moving on to final, the third track, uh, track also, third track also has uh, sessions 
uh, organizing from A to Z. Uh, session one is one important area, sustainability. Uh, there will be uh, six papers presented uh, under the uh, uh, track 3A, sustainability. Uh, then uh, the track 3B, uh, the second session uh, in Then uh, going into uh, track 3C, the third session under the track 3, uh, mainly uh, discussing on sociology and psychology, psychology related research outcomes. And uh, there will be uh, six research papers presenting on uh, that area. Then we are having uh, the, the uh, third uh, track uh, B uh, on the health and well being and E also health and well-being. In this new normal situation under the COVID-19 health crisis, uh, another area we need to discuss is health and well-being. So that is why we have given priority for uh, session D. Uh, I think uh, there are about uh, nine papers presenting and there will be again uh, five papers presenting under the uh, track 3E, uh, health and well-being. So uh, all together uh, from uh, today afternoon, uh, 1.30 uh, to uh, tomorrow uh, evening, there will be uh, 102 research papers uh, presented in this research con conference under 18 sessions, under 18 sessions. So anyway, uh, the most important thing that we need to understand after this uh, opening ceremony, we are moving to uh, plenary sessions. Each track has one plenary session. There are three plenary sessions conducted uh, for each session. Uh, the first uh, plenary session uh, on the track one is conducted uh, by uh, Professor Karen Jayasinghe, uh, Chair Professor in Accounting uh, from the University of Essex, United Kingdom. The second, uh, uh, second track uh, se uh, session uh, before starting the session A, at 1 o'clock today, uh, there will be plenary session uh, with uh, organizing uh, Emeritus Professor, Professor Marin Pereira, uh, the former Dean of Education, University of Colombo, will deliver the plenary speech from 1 to 1.30 uh, under the uh, track uh, 2. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, we, are we are having Track 3, uh, based on track, track 3, today afternoon, uh, there will be a, a keynote speech uh, delivered by Dr. Kaumali Yanipti uh, from the uh, University of Wolverhampton, uh, United Kingdom. So uh, we can see these uh, views from plenary speakers as uh, from the keynote speaker on the relevant uh, track and relevant sessions. So I hope that uh, this conference has uh, immense contribution to the uh, social sciences and humanity literature in Sri Lanka because uh, I think even under this uh, uh, NCAS, this is the first time uh, we accepted and uh, published 100 full papers as uh, scholars, uh, the Sri Lankans and others uh, are authored. So therefore, I think this uh, uh, conference will make not only quantity but also quality of uh, the social science and humanities researchers upgrade. So saying that, uh, thank you very much. Please be uh, with us. Uh, that this entire uh, session is going on uh, uh, Zoom-based uh, discussions. So I hope that you will be uh, with, uh, with us. And any uh, issues related to technical issues, you can contact us uh, through the uh, the NCAS websites. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. That brings us to the end of the inaugural ceremony. Now I would like to invite Mr. Sampath Chandrasen, the coordinator of the IRSSS 2020, to propose the board of thanks.
great privilege and honor to have been invited to deliver the vote of thanks in this grand occasion of the Sir International Research Group of Telephone, Social Sciences and Humanities 2020. First of all, I wish to extend my sincere thanks on behalf of NCS to Senior Professor Sampa Tamarkunda, Chairman of Ulysses Grand Commission. Sir, despite your heavy work schedule, your concern is great distance for the success of your after the success of this entire event. Sir, thank you very much. I am very much grateful to our acting director, NCS, and uh, Vice Chairman of United Grand Commission, Senior Professor Janita A. Jansky, for her valuable guide, guidance for making this symposium a success, not only as the administrator, but also as a scientist. Your presence gave great importance for this case. Your advice and encouragement were available all the time for the entire event as the leader of NCS team. Madam, thank you very much for all your advice and guidance. My very special heartiest thanks goes to Senior Professor H.T. Karuna Ratna, Visiting Research Fellow of NCS, who played the key role in organizing this International Annual Research Symposium. You gave us valuable advice and guidance all the time in each and every activity of this research symposium. The enormous support given day and night in organizing this event. Doing each and every work related to the research symposium was a great strength for this event. Thank you very much, sir, for all that you have done. And on behalf of NCS, I wish to express my sincere thanks and gratitude to keynote speaker, Emeritus Professor Siri Hetike, who accepted our invitation to grace the occasion of the third international research symposium. Thank you very much, for, sir, for your inspirational speech. I wish to thank you all, Council of Region and Council of Management, for their participation online in this symposium. And all the academic staff from universities and officials of other organizations who attended this event. And it is a great pleasure to have you all here online today. I would like to thank, I would like to take this opportunity to express your, our heartiest thanks to the plenary speaker, Prof. Kalum Jaisinga, University of Texas, United Kingdom, Emeritus Professor Mari E. S. Pereira, former Dean Faculty of Education, University of Colombo, and Dr. Komali Genetti, University of Wolverhampton, University United Kingdom and University of Melbourne, Australia. My heartfelt thanks goes to all members of organizing committee who support us day and night. In present, uh, Professor Prasant Narangoda and Professor Kodagoda, uh, Dr. Sahanga, and Dr. Puli, and Dr. Kishari, and Dr. Panajaduri, and Dr. Sagar and Dr. Janita, and Dr. Kaumar, Prasanti and all non-presenter organizing committee were picked up by meeting at NCS and also virtually discuss and plan the symposium. My sincere attitude is also extended to all the track chairs, session chairs, discussions, reviewers, and editors. Despite their very busy academic work schedule, many senior academics engage in technical activities 
related to this same group and contributed by chair in the system. Also, my thanks goes to Mr. Jintani Amartinga, Senior Sinal Versa, Mr. Vinodita, Mr. Prabhat, Mr. Dharmatilaka, Mr. Gayan, Mr. Prabodhani, Mr. Bhavantar, and Mr. Balasurya, and the Mr. Sanjeeva, and all non-academic staff members of NCS who gave their fullest cooperation always to make this research symposium a success. Our sincere, sincere gratitude is extended to all the NCS grantees and other authors who submitted their extended abstract on time for this symposium and also for all the <coughs> completed ongoing grant subscribers who have attended this event online. In fact, we organize this symposium annually, especially for benefit of them. Also, the staff of ULBAC should be thankful for their support for this event. And uh, especially, I would like to remember the late Professor uh, Vidya Jyoti, uh, Emeritus Professor Chenaka Bandar Nayaka, who established this institute, and other past directors. So, <coughs> and uh, finally, I thank each and every person who supported in various ways to make this event a success. And I wish you have, I wish you all have fruitful technical session. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. With that, we conclude the ceremonial inauguration of the third International Research Symposium on Social Sciences and Humanities organized by the National Center for Advanced Studies. And I would like to invite all of you to join for the respective sessions using the online links. Thank you very much. And the ref refreshments are served downstairs. Thank you very much.